What is going on, my brothers and sisters in Christ? All right. Well, today is another Genesis 3 study, and we're still talking about the Messiah. All right. There's so much on the Messiah that y'all need to understand. He is our anointed. All right. And when we get more deeper into, uh, let me uh, explain say that a little more uh clear as we get deeper into the scripture with the scriptures that pertain to jesus christ y'all need to understand why paul says what he says in the new testament and peter says what he says in the new testament and all the apostles and everything so y'all need to understand that all right so before we dive into the word of god let's open up with a word of prayer shall we Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for allowing us to be able to do this study as a family spiritually. Holy Spirit, have your way. Please forgive us of our many, many sins and help us to be more like you. Renew our minds, renew our, uh, renew our strength, help us spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, help us to do everything that's according to your will, not our own. Uh, forgive us of anything that we trespass. And if we trespass anybody, that's our brothers and sisters, please forgive us. Help us to succeed in everything that's according to your will. Uh, Lord, everyone that doesn't know you, help them be able to get a chance to get to know you. Lead them to all truth, which is you. We ask and we pray all this in the name of Yahuwah, Yahusha, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. I want to bring up the speed of the seven deadly scriptures. All right. Remember. Go to the Acts of the Apostles, and you're going to go to chapter 17 and read verses 10 through 15. And then you're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, read that whole chapter. And then you're going to read the whole chapter of verse 13. Okay. And then when you go to Revelations, go to chapter 1, read verses 1 through 3. And then Galatians, go to chapter 5, read that whole chapter. And then chapter 6, and read verses 1 through 10. And then go to chap uh, John chapter 3, and read verses 1 through 21. And then go to John chapter 16, and read verses 5 through 15. And don't believe what I post. Research what I post. And dear God, fix me when I'm the problem. Protect me when I'm not. And dear God, please calm my mind, heal my heart, and take away my worries. Romans 15, 4, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, stay alert, watch out, for your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Isaiah 28.10 He tells us everything over and over, one line at a time, one line at a time, a little here and a little there. 2 Timothy 2.15 Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth psalms 23 3 he renews my strength he guides me along the right paths bringing honor to his name and then psalms 25 11, for the honor of your name O lord forgive my many many sins psalms 31 3 you are my rock and my fortress for the honor of your name lead me out of this danger proverbs 18 13 spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish Ephesians 5.11, take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness, instead expose them. Deuteronomy 12.32, so be careful to obey all the commands I give you. You must not add anything to them or subtract anything from them. Deuteronomy 4.2, do not add to or subtract from these commands I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you. Proverbs 36, do not add to his words or he may rebuke you and expose you as a liar. In Revelations 22, 19. Now, this is dealing with the book of Revelation. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. Ecclesiastes 3, 14. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. 
2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Isaiah 8.20, look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. Deuteronomy 19.15, you must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. 2 Timothy 2.25-26, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Second Peter 1, 20 through 21. All, above all, understand this. No prophecy of scripture comes about from a person's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever brought forth by human will. Rather, people spoke from God as they were moved by the rock Hakadesh. That's the tree of life version. The NLT will say this for Second Peter 1, 20 through 21. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. First Corinthians 2, 13. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know the person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. 1 Corinthians 12.10, he gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the temptation in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. The Bible is meant to be bread for daily use, not cake for special occasion. True believers don't go to the church to find out what's in the Bible. True believers go to the Bible to find out what the church should be teaching. And the church does not determine what the Bible teaches. The Bible determines what the church must teach. And born again is not a religion. It is a life changed by the Ruach HaKadosh, John 3, 3. Yahushua answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Yahuwah. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Church is who we are not where we go. The Greek word ecclesiastia, often translated as church, actually means an assembly of God's called out ones, holy and consecrated unto him, 
in the context of scriptures, not a building or place to meet. If you need salvation, here it is. God's salvation gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Believe by faith and faith alone and receive eternal life. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And in order to follow Jesus, you must unfollow the world. Deuteronomy 4, 35. You are shown so that you might know that Adonai is God. There is no other beside him. Matthew 5, 11 through 12. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of people things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way, teaching about salt and light. Jeremiah 23, 23. Am I a God who is only close at hand, says the Lord? No, I am far away at the same time. Hebrews 9.12 With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Philemon 1.6 And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Romans 8, 9, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Colossians 1, 27, for God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. 1 John 4.17 And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. 1 Corinthians 13.12 Now we can now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Romans 12, 1 through 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Hebrews 10.10 10, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Hebrews 10.12 But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Hebrews 10.14-18 for by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Second Peter 1. 3 through 4. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. 
and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Second Peter 1, 5 through 7. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. 2 Peter 1, 8 through 9. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to, ve to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. Isaiah 46.10 Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient time, what is yet to come, saying, My purpose will stand, and I will accomplish all that I please. That's the tree of life version. 2 Timothy 2.2 you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Philippians 2, 3-4 Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of your, uh, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Acts of the Apostles 20, 24 through 27. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And I and now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault, for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Romans 8.1 So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Matthew 6, 3-4 But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Matthew 6, 34, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Matthew 18, 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Philippians 1, 6, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Religion is the practice of training your mind to ignore evidence, logic, and reason while being able to believe in fairy tales based on faith alone and being proud of it. Matthew thirteen sixteen, But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Belief is equal to obedience. The verse everyone loves to quote is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 20 verses later, the verse everyone loves to ignore is whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That's John 3.36. Psalms 34, 19, the righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. Romans 8, 28, 
And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. The difference between Jesus and religion. Religion shames people for having dirty feet while Jesus kneels down to wash them. Proverbs 24, 16. The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. Galatians 2.20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave me, I mean, and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians 13.4-7 Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoice whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. John 13, 34 through 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Mark 10, 27. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. 2 Timothy 1 9. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. Now, guess what? The government, media, and religion, they all brainwash you. So if anyone call you brainwash, which brainwash are you from? Are you brainwashed by the government, media, and religion? Or are you brainwashed from being cleansed and being born again and actually getting the good brainwash? Success is when the Lord writes your name in his book of life. Discernment means being able to tell your Judas from your Peter. Peter had a bad day. Judas had a bad heart. Peter, you restore, while Judas, you release. Titus 1.13 this description is true, so rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and free from doctrinal error. Hebrews 11.6 And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Romans 4.5 But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God, who, forgiver, who forgives sinners. Titus 3.5 He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 11.6 And it is impossible to please God without faith. I believe we read this before. Romans 4, 5, but people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Mark 10, 25 through 27. In fact, it is easier for a camel to grow, go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. 1 Peter 2, 24. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Jesus. 1 Peter 3, 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one can come to the Father except through me. Hebrews 1, 3. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Hebrews 4.15 This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. 1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Hebrews six eighteen. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have a great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. John 17, 17. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Romans 10, 9 through 11. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved, as the scriptures tell us. Anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Isaiah 43.10 but you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There, ha there never has been, and there never will be. Jesus didn't call you to be Catholic, Pentecostal, Baptist, or any other denomination. He called you to be born again. Titus 3, 5-7. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Stop walking around with a mouthful of scriptures and a heart full of hate. All right, here's a spiritual warfare. We're going to pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Holy Father, that no weapon formed against me will prosper, although the weapon may form. I thank you that the weapons of my warfare are not carnal weapons, but they are mighty through you for the pulling down of every demonic stronghold. I break every curse of the enemy against me, my family, and my bloodline. I break and counsel every hex, witchcraft, prayer, black magic, white magic, sorcerer, and sacrifice of the enemy. Everything that the enemy has unleashed against me, I cancel it, cage it, and bind it. In the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, making it null and void, I bind, cage, and chain every demon spirit trying to enforce a curse against me and my family in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that I am more than a conqueror. I thank you that I have victory and that I am redeemed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In John 15, 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. Philippians four nineteen. And this same God who takes care of me 
will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Acceptable. This is the truly way to worship him. Philippians 2.17, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything instead of pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Look, Revelations 3, 20. Look. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Luke 24, 44 through 47. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah will suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials gold silver jewels wood hay or straw but on the judgment day fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done the fire will show if a person's work has any value if the work survives that builder will receive a reward but if the work is burnt up the builder will suffer great loss the builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames 2 Corinthians 9.10 For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Hebrews 12.11 No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reaches deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Proverbs 10, 5. A wise youth harvest in the summer. But one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. Matthew 3, 8. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. James 1, 22 through 27. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in the mirror, in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. John 12, 25. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. 
John 1, 11 through 12. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. John 3, 3. Jesus answered him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless a person is born again, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, he cannot ever see and experience the kingdom of God. Matthew 25, 23. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Now remember, becoming a perfect Christian is not the goal. Walking with God is. Knowing God is. Following God is. Listening to God is. Obeying God is. These are the things you were made for. Proverbs 16, 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Isaiah 66, 24. And as they go out, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. For the worms that devour them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never go out. All who pass by will view them with utter horror. Sex won't satisfy you. Fame won't satisfy you. Drugs won't satisfy you. Money won't satisfy you. Alcohol won't satisfy you. Success won't satisfy you. Life is empty without Jesus. He is the only one who can testify who can satisfy your heart. Amen. Micah 4, 5. Though the nations around us follow their idols, we will follow the Lord our God forever and ever. 1 John 5, 7-8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. When asked, what is more important, praying or reading the Bible? I asked, what is more important, breathing in or breathing out? That's Charles Spurgeon. Psalms 9, 7 through 10. But the Lord reigns forever, executing judgment from his throne. He will judge the world with justice and rule the nations with fairness. The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, O Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, our Messiah, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the miracle of the ages, the supplementative of everything good. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's irresistible. He's invincible. The heavens of heavens cannot contain him. Men cannot explain him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him and learned that they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault with him. The witnesses couldn't agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't stop him. He has always been and always will be. He had no predecessor and will have no successor. He can't be impeached. Him and he isn't going to resign. His name is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. His offices are manifold. His reign is righteous. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He franchised the meek. He guards the besieged. He heals the sick. He provides strength to the weak. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. Now seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on ye while he Call on ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. 
and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 2 Peter 3.12 Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day he will set the heavens on fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. 2 Timothy 4.8 And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Revelations 22, 8-9 I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. And, I, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers, the prophets, and as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. Romans 11.25 I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles come to Christ. People on earth hate to hear the word repent. Those in hell wish they could hear it one more time. Dear God, give me the strength to break through because I'm tired of breaking down. And dear God, if it no longer serves my life, please give me the strength to remove it from my life. And dear God, guard my life from the things that seem good but are no good. And dear God, please protect me from my enemies that are disguised as friends praying for my failure and not my success. And dear God, even if it seems perfect for me, block it from my life if it holds no purpose for me. Now remember, remember this, it doesn't matter how slow you go, as long as you don't stop. Psalms 119, 144. Your laws are always right. Help me to understand them so I may live. Psalms 119, 142. Your justice is eternal and your instructions are perfectly true. 1 Corinthians 131. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, Boast only about the Lord. 1 John 4.4 4, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people, because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Psalms 121.2 My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Ephesians 1.13 And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believe in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. Romans 5, 5. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we are when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. This is William Shakespeare's famous quote. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. He collapses in one, not through eleven. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever, ever truly new. We don't understand. We don't remember what happened in the past. And and future generations. No one will remember what we are doing now. 
He collapses one eight. Everything is wormsome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened the new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure hearts, I mean, with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. Isaiah 59 21. And this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit will not leave them, and neither will these words I have given you. They will be on your lips and on the lips of your children and your children's children forever. I, the Lord, have spoken. Matthew 11, 11 through 19. I tell you the truth, of all who ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. And even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. And from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. For before John came, all the prophets in the law of Moses looked forward to this present time. And if you are willing to accept what I say, he is Elijah, the one the prophets said will come. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So what can I compare this generation? It is like children playing a game in, a pub in the public square. They complain to their friends, we play wedding songs, and you didn't dance, so we Play funeral songs and you didn't mourn. For John didn't spend his time eating and drinking, and you say he's possessed by a demon. The Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. Psalms 19, 7 through 9. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The, the commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Romans 9, 11 through 13. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses people according to his own purpose, purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of the scriptures, I love Jacob, but I rejected Esau. John 5.39 you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. John 14, 16, and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. John 14, 17, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. John 14, 26. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Job 19, 25 through 26. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. 1 John 3, 9. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. 1 Peter 2, 2. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Remember, you are a spirit, body, and soul. 
There are three aspects to one's being in existence. These three aspects are the spirit, body, and soul. Each has its own purpose and can be attacked and defended in different ways. Now, if you don't teach them God's truth, Satan will gladly deceive them with his lies. Now, remember, Satan can't destroy the gospel. He only lies about it by adding, subtracting, and twisting the scriptures. Now, God formed us. Sin deformed us. The Bible informs us, but Jesus transforms us. And remember, God stills you, reassures you, leads you, encourages you, forgives you, calms you, empowers you, and comforts you, while the devil's tactics is to rush you, frightens you, pushes you, confuses you, condemns you, stresses you, discourages you, and worries you. So, in this version of when we talk about the Messiah, we're going to talk about the sin and guilt offerings. All right. The burnt offerings, the grain and meal offerings and the fellowship peace offerings. All right. And then before we go any further, if we have time, we will start talking about the holy days and why the pagan days, holidays have corrupted our, you know, holy days, basically. All right. So let's start with sin and guilt offerings. So Isaiah 53 10 says this, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Matthew 20, 28, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right, so now get your highlighters out and start opening up your Bible so you can understand the Torah more. All right, so when people talk about, oh, we don't follow the laws, you will understand you have to be born again. It's the Holy Spirit that will take care of that stuff for you. All right, so here's the procedures for the sin offering. Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. This is how you are to deal with those who sin unintentionally by doing anything that violates one of the Lord's commands. If the high priest sins, bringing guilt upon the entire community, he must give a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He must present the Lord a young bull with no defects. He must bring the bull to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle, lay his hand on the bull's head and slaughter it before the Lord. The high priest will then take some of the bull's blood into the tabernacle, dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the inner curtain of the sanctuary. The priest will then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar for fragrant incense that stands in the Lord's presence inside the tabernacle. He will pour out the rest of the bull's blood at the base of the altar for burnt offerings at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then the priest must remove all the fat of the bull to be offered as a sin offering. This includes all the fat around the eternal organs, the two kidneys and the fat around them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver. He must remove these along with the kidneys, just as he does with the cattle, with cattle offered as a peace offering and burn them on the altar of burnt offerings but he must take whatever is left of the bull its high meat head legs eternal organs and dung and carry it away to a place outside the camp that is ceremonially clean the place where the ashes are dumped there on the ash heap he will burn it on a wood fire if the entire Israelite community sins by violating one of the Lord's commands, but the people don't realize it, they are still guilty. When they become aware of their sin, the people must bring a young bull as an offering for their sin and present it before the tabernacle. The elders of the community must then lay their hands on the bull's head and slaughter it before the Lord. The high priest will then take some of the bull's blood into the tabernacle dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the inner curtain. He will then put some of the blood on its horns, on its on the horns of the altar for fragrant incense that stands in the Lord's presence inside the tabernacle. He will pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar for burnt offerings at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then the priest must remove all the animal's fat and burn it on the altar 
just as he does with the bull offered as a sin offering for the high priest. Through this process, the priest will purify the people, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. Then the priest must take what is left of the bull and carry it outside the camp and burn it there, just as is done with the sin offering for the high priest. This offering is for the sin of the entire congregation of Israel. If one of, the, of Israel's leaders sins by violating one of the commands of the Lord, his God, but doesn't realize it, he is still guilty. When he becomes aware of his sin, he must bring as his offering a male goat with no defects. He must lay his hand on the goat's head and slaughter it at the place where burnt offerings are slaughtered before the Lord. This is an offering for his sin. Then the priest will dip his finger in the blood of the sin offering and put it on the horns of the altar for burnt offerings. He will pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Then he will he must burn all the goat's fat on the altar, just as he does with the peace offering. Through this process, the priest will purify the leader for from his sin, making him right with the Lord, and he will be forgiven. If any of the common people sin by violating one of the Lord's commands, but they don't realize it, they are still guilty. When they become aware of their sin, they must bring as an offering for their sin a female goat with no defects. They must lay a hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it at the at the place where burnt offerings are slaughtered. Then the priest will dip his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar for burnt offerings. He will pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Then he must remove all the goat's fat, just as he does with the fat of the peace offering. He will burn the fat on the altar and it will be a pleasing aroma, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Through this process, the priest will purify the people, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. If the people bring a sheep as their sin offering, it must be a female with no defects. They must lay a hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it at the place where burnt offerings are slaughtered. Then the priest will dip his finger in the blood of the sin offering and pour it on the horns of the altar for burnt offerings. He will pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Then he must remove all the sheep's fat, just as he does with the fat of a sheep presented as a peace offering. He will burn the fat on the altar on top of the special gifts presented to the Lord. Through this process, the priests will purify the people from their sin, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. Huh. Do we have to do any of this in Leviticus 4? No, because Jesus is our high priest. He's our procedure for the sin offering. All right, now turn on over to Le Leviticus chapter 5, sins requiring a sin offering. If you are called to testify about something you have seen or that you know about it, it is sinful to refuse to testify and you will be punished for your sin. Or suppose you unknowingly touch something that is ceremonially unclean such as the carcass of an unclean animal when you realize what you have done you must admit your defilement and your guilt this is true whether it is a wild animal a domestic animal or an animal that scurries along the ground or suppose you unknowingly touch something that makes a person unclean when you realize what you have done, you must admit your guilt. Or suppose you make a foolish vow of any kind, whether its purpose is for good or for bad. When you realize its foolishness, you must admit your guilt. When you become aware of your guilt in any of these ways, you must confess your sin. Then you must bring to the Lord as the penalty for your sin a female from the flock, either a sheep or a goat. This is a sin offering with which the priest will purify you from your sin, making you right with the Lord. But if you cannot afford to bring a sheep, you may bring to the Lord two turtle doves or two young pigeons as the penalty for your sin. One of the birds will be for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. You must bring them to the priest who will present the first bird as the sin offering. He will wring its neck, but without severing its head from the body. Then he will sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering against the sides of the altar, and the rest of the blood will be drained out 
at the base of the altar. This is an offering for sin. The priest will then prepare the second bird as a burnt offering, following all the procedures that have been prescribed. Through this process, the priest will purify you from your sin, making you right with the Lord, and you will be forgiven. If you cannot afford to bring two turtle doves or two pit young pigeons, you may bring two quarts of choice flour for your sin offering. Since it is an offering for sin, you must not moisten it with olive oil or put any frankincense on it. Take the flour to the priest who will scoop out a handful as a representative portion. He will burn it on the altar on top of the special gifts presented to the Lord. It is an offering for sin. Through the pro this process, the priest will purify those who are guilty of any of these sins, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. The rest of the flour will belong to the priest, just as with the grain offering, procedures for the guilt offering. Then the Lord said to Moses, if one of you commits a sin by unintentionally defiling the Lord's sacred property, you must bring a guilt offering to the Lord. The offering must be your own ram with no defects, or you may buy one of equal value with silver as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. You must make restitution for the sacred property you have harmed by paying for the loss, plus an additional 20%. When you give the payment to the priest, he will purify you with the ram sacrifice as a guilt offering, making your making you right with the Lord, and you will be forgiven. Suppose you sin by violating one of the Lord's commands, even if you are unaware of what you have done. You are guilty and will be punished for your sin. For a guilt offering, you must bring to the priest your own ram with no defects, or you may buy one of equal value. Through this process, the priest will purify you from your unintentional sin, making you right with the Lord, and you will be forgiven. This is a guilt offering, for you have been guilty of an offense against the Lord. All right, now hop on over to Leviticus chapter 6, sins requiring a guilt offering. Then the Lord said to Moses, suppose one of you sins against your associates and is unfaithful to the Lord. Suppose you cheat in a deal involving a secure deposit, or you steal or commit fraud, or you find lost property and lie about it, or you lie while swearing to tell the truth, or you commit any other such sin. If you have sinned in any of these ways, you are guilty. You must give back whatever you stole or the money you took by extortion or the security deposit or the lost property you found or anything obtained by swearing falsely. You must make restitution by paying the full price plus an additional 20% to the person you have harmed. On the same day, you must present a guilt offering as a guilt offering to the Lord. You must bring to the priest your own ram with no defects, or you may buy one of equal value. Through this process, the priest will purify you before the Lord, making you right with him, and you will be forgiven for any of these sins you have committed. Further instructions for the burnt offering. Then the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the burnt offering. The burnt offering must be left on top of the altar until the next morning and the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night in the morning after the priest on duty has put on his official linen clothing and linen undergarments he must clean out the ashes of the burnt offering and put them beside the altar then he must take off these garments change back into his regular clothes and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean Meanwhile, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must never go out. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. He will then burn the fat of the peace offering on it. Remember, the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. Further instructions for the grain offering. These are the instructions regarding the grain offering. Aaron's sons must present this offering to the Lord in front of the altar. The priest on duty will take from the grain offering a handful of the choice flour, moistened with olive oil together with all the frankincense. He will burn this representative portion on the altar as an pleasing aroma to the Lord. Aaron and his sons may eat the rest of the flour, 
but it must be baked without yeast and eaten in a sacred place within the courtyard of the tabernacle. Remember, it must never be prepared with yeast. I have given it to the priests as their share of the special gifts presented to me. Like the sin offering and the guilt offering, it is most holy. Any of Aaron's male descendants may eat from the special gifts presented to the Lord. This is the permanent right from generation to generation. Anyone or anything that touches these offerings will become holy. Procedures for the ordination offering. Then the Lord said to Moses, on the day Aaron and his sons are anointed, they must present to the Lord the standard grain offering of two quarts of choice flour, have to be offered in the morning and have to be offered in the evening. It must be carefully mixed with olive oil and cooked on a griddle. Then slice this grain offering and present it as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. In each generation, the high priest who succeeds Aaron must prepare this same offering. It belongs to the Lord and must be burned up completely. This is a permanent law. All such grain offerings of a priest must be burned up entirely. None of it may be eaten. Further instructions for the sin offering. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the sin offering. The animal given as an offering for sin is a most holy offering, and it, and it must be slaughtered in the Lord's presence at the place where the burnt offerings are slaughtered. The priest who offers the sacrifice as a sin offering must eat his portion in a sacred place within the courtyard of the tabernacle. Anyone or anything that touches the sexual, uh, sacrificial meat will become holy. In any of the sacrificial blood spatters on a person's clothing, the soiled garment must be washed in a sacred place. If a clay plot is used to boil the sacrificial meat, it must then be broken. If a bronze pot is used, it must be scored and thoroughly rinsed with water. Any male from a priest's family may eat from this offering. It is most holy. But the offering for sin may not be eaten if its blood was brought into the tabernacle as an offering for purification in the holy place. It must be completely burnt with fire. All right, I'll hop on over to Le Leviticus chapter 7. Further instructions for the guilt offering. These are the instructions for the guilt offering. It is most holy. The animal sacrifice as a guilt offering must be slaughtered at the place where the burnt offerings are slaughtered, and its blood must be splattered against all sides of the altar. The priest will then offer all its fat on the altar, including the fat of the broad tail, the fat around its, the eternal organs, the two kidneys, and the fat around them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver. These are the two be, these are to be removed with the kidneys, and the priest will burn them on the altar as a special gift presented to the Lord. This is the guilt offering. Any male from a peace, priest family may eat the meat. It must be eaten in a sacred place, for it is most holy. The same instructions apply to both the guilt offering and the sin offering. Both belong to the priest who uses them to purify someone, making that person right with the Lord. In the case of the burnt offering, the priest may keep the high of the sacrificed animal. In the case of the burnt offering, the priest may keep the hide of the sacrifice animal. Any grain offering that has been baked in an oven, prepared in a pan, or cooked on a griddle belongs to the priest who presents it. All other grain offerings, whether made of dry flour or flour moistened with olive oil, are to be shared equally among all the priests, the descendants of Aaron. Further instructions for the peace offering. These are the instructions regarding the different kinds of peace offerings that may be presented to the Lord. If you present your peace offering as an expression of thanksgiving, the usual animal sacrifice must be accompanied by various kinds of bread made without yeast. Thin cakes mixed with olive oil, wafer spread with oil, and cakes made of choice flour mixed with olive oil. This peace offering of thanksgiving must also be accompanied by loaves of bread made with yeast. One of each kind of bread must be presented as a gift to the Lord. It will then belong 
to the priest who splattered the blood of the peace offering against the altar. The meat of the peace offering of Thanksgiving must be eaten on the same day it is offered. None of it may be saved the next morning. If you bring an offering to fulfill a vow or as a voluntary offering, the meat must be eaten on the same day the sacrifice is offered. But whatever is left over may be eaten on the second day. Any meat left over until the third day must be, a, be completely burnt up. If any of the meat from the peace offering is eaten on the third day, the person who presented it will not be accepted by the Lord. You will receive no credit for offering it. By then the meat will be contaminated if you eat it you would be punished for your sin. Meat that touches anything ceremony unclean may not be eaten. It must be completely burnt up. The rest of the meat may be eaten, but only by people who are ceremonially clean. If you are ceremonially unclean and you eat meat from a peace offering that ha was presented to the Lord, you will be cut off from the community. If you touch anything that is unclean, whether it is human defilement or an unclean animal or any other unclean detestable thing and then eat meat from a peace offering presented to the lord you will be cut off from this from the community all right now hop on over to numbers chapter 15 and we're going to go to verse one laws concerning offerings then the lord told moses give the following instructions to the people of israel when you finally settle in the land i am giving you you will offer special gifts as a pleasing aroma to the lord these gifts may take the form of a burnt offering, a sacrifice to fulfill a vow, a voluntary offering or an offering at any of your annual festivals, and they may be taken from your herds of cattle or your flocks of sheep and goats. When you present these offerings, you must also give the Lord a grain offering of two quarts of choice flour mixed with one quart of olive oil. For each lamb offered as a burnt offering or a special sacrifice, you must also present one quart of wine as a liquid offering. If the sacrifice is a ram, give a grain offering of four quarts of choice flour mixed with a third of a gallon of olive oil, and give a third of a gallon of wine as a liquid offering. This, it, this will be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. When you present a young bull as a burnt offering or as a sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a peace offering to the Lord, you must also give a grain offering of six quarts of choice flour mixed with two quarts of olive oil and give two quarts of wine as a liquid offering. This will be a pleasing. Uh, this will be a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Each sacrifice of a bull, ram, lamb or young goat should be prepared in this way follow these instructions with each offering you present you present all of you native born israelites must follow these instructions when you offer a special gift as a pleasing aroma to the lord and if any foreigners visit you or live among you and want to present a special gift as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, they must follow these same procedures. Native-born Israelites and foreigners are equal before the Lord and are subject to the same decrees. This is a permanent law for you to be observed from generation to generation. The same instructions and regulations will apply both to you and to the foreigners living among you. Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you arrive in the land where I am taking you and you eat the crops that grow there, you must set some aside as a sacred offering to the Lord. Present a cake from the first of the flour you grind and set it aside as a sacred offering as you do with the first grain from the threshing floor throughout the generation to come. You are to present a sacred offering to the Lord each year from the the first of your crown flower but suppose you unintentionally fail to carry out all these commands that the lord has given you through moses and suppose your descendants in the future fail to do everything the lord has commanded through moses if the mistake was made unintentionally and the community was unaware of it the whole community must present a young bull for a burnt offering as an pleasing aroma to the lord it must be offered along with its prescribed grain offering and liquid offering and with one male goat for a sin offering. With it, the priests will purify the whole community of Israel, making them right with the Lord, and they will be forgiven. For it 
was an unintentional sin, and they have corrected it with their offerings to the Lord, the special gift and the sin offering. The whole community of Israel will be forgiven, including the foreigners living among you, for all the people were involved in the sin. If one individual commits an unintentional sin, the guilty person must bring a one-year-old female goat for a sin offering. The priest will sacrifice it to purify the guilty person before the Lord, and that person will be forgiven. These same instructions apply both to the native-born Israelites and to the foreigners living among you. But those who brazenly violate the Lord's will, whether native-born or foreigners, have blasphemed the Lord, and they and they must be cut off from the community. Since they have treated the Lord's word with contempt and deliberately disobeyed his command, they must be completely cut off and suffer the punishment for their guilt. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Matthew 5.23-24 So if you are Presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. All right, go to Luke chapter 19. We're going to start at verse 1. Jesus and Zacchaeus. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a Singapore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at the Cacchaeus and called him by name. The Cacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. The Cacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Parable of the Ten Servants The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said, and because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said, A noble man was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I am gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invest your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted to you. So you will be governed of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invest your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. The third servant brought back only the original amount of the of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crap you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then, turning to the others standing nearby, the king ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. 
and as for these in enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king bring them in and execute them right there right here in front of me jesus triumph entry after telling this story jesus went on toward jerusalem walking ahead of his disciples as he came to the towns of bethpage and bethany on the mount of olives he sent two disciples ahead go into that village over there he told them as you enter it you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden untie it and bring it here if anyone asks why are you untying that colt just say the lord needs it so they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were to untie it, the owners asked them, Why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started, ta oh, started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven and highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears and into cheers. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground. And your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Jesus cleared the temple. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, The scriptures declare my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. After that, he taught daily in the temple, but the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the other leaders of the people began planning how to kill him. But they could think of nothing, because all the people hung on every word, he said. All right, now hop on over to Luke chapter 2, the birth of Jesus. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Coronius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judah, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them, the shepherds and angels. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen.
It was just as the angel had told them. Jesus is presented in the temple. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the given, the name given by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses, after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required to end the law of the Lord, either a pair of, a, of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The prophecy of Simon. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. The prophecy of Anna. Anna, a prophet was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanelio from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married, only seven years. Then she lived as a widow at the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. Jesus speaks with the teachers. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed and his understand at his understanding at his and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, Why have you done this to us? Your father and I have and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search? he asked. Didn't you know I'm that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Luke 21, 1 through 4. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said. This poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. All right, now hop on over to 1 Timothy. We're going to go to chapter 3, Leaders in the Church. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reapproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. 
He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil will cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons must be well respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith now revealed and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. And hop down to verse 16. Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the spirit. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations. He was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. First Timothy 5, 19 through 20. Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church. This will serve, serve as a strong warning to others. Philippians 4, 18. At the moment I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Ephrotius. They are a sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Now hop on over to 1 Corinthians 9, 13 through 14. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple? And those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. In 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For the scriptures say, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserves their pay. All right, now hop back to Levit Leviticus chapter one, procedures for the burnt offering. The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and said to him, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd of cattle or from your flock of sheep and goats. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects, but it is, but it to bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle. So you may be acceptable by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. Then slaughter the young bull in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will present the animal's blood by splattering it against all sides of the altar that stands at the entrance to the tabernacle. Then skin the animal and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, will build a wood fire on the altar. They will arrange the piece, pieces of the offering, including the head and fat, on the wood burning on the altar. But the eternal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifices on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift and a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the flock, it may be either a sheep or a goat but it must be a male with no defects. Slaughter the animal on the north side of the altar in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. Then cut the animal in pieces, and the priests will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and the fat, on the wood burning on the altar. But the eternal organs, I'll repeat what that says, including the head and fat, on the wood burning on the altar, 
but the eternal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift and a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If you present a bird as a burnt offering to the Lord, choose either a turtle dove or a young pigeon. The priest will take the bird to the altar rearing off its head and burning it on the altar but first he must drain its blood against the side of the altar the priest must also remove the crop and the feathers and throw them in the ashes uh, on the east side of the of the altar then grasping the bird by its wings the priest will tear the bird open but without tearing it apart the then he will burn it as a burnt offering on the wood burning on the altar it is a special gift of pleasing aroma to the lord psalms 51 16 through 17 you do not want you you do not desire a sacrifice or would offer or i will offer one i'll repeat this whole thing psalms 51 16 through 17 you don't desire a sacrifice or i would offer one you do not want a burnt offering the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Matthew 26, 39. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not my own. Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Philippians 2.17 But I will rejoice even if I lose my life pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. 2 Timothy 4, 6-7 as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained. We ought to praise God. Let's count our blessings. I'll teach you a lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God. Yeah, yeah. Uh. We ought to praise God. Let's count our blessings. I'll teach you a lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God. Yeah. We ought to praise God. Let's count our blessings. Let's count our lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God.